Today is Wednesday, October 13th, and the time is 9 o'clock. The AB 3121 Task Force meeting is now called to order. Good morning, my name is Camila Moore, and I am the chairperson of the task force. Before we begin, let us have the staff do a roll call for attendance and establish whether we have a quorum. Parliamentarian Johnson. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Belton. Would you please call the roll and determine if we have a quorum? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moore and Parliamentarian Johnson. We will go in order and ask that the task force members please indicate their presence. Chair Moore? Here. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? Present. Senator Stephen Bradford? Here. Dr. Cheryl Grill. Present. Lisa Holder. <clears throat> Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer. Here. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis. Present. John Tamaki. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Seth. Here. Madam Chair, there are nine members of the task force and five members are needed for quorum. There are nine members present. A quorum has been reestablished this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Belton. Members of the task force and members of the public, welcome to the fourth meeting of the historic California Reparations Task Force. The task force scopes and powers are predicated on AB 3121, a legislative bill authored by California Secretary of State Shirley Weber and signed into passage by California Governor Gavin Newsom in September 2020. The law requires the nine member task force to examine slavery that existed in the United States, discrimination in public and private sectors against those who were enslaved and their descendants, and lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery. The law requires the task force recommend how the state of California will issue a formal apology, how to eliminate discrimination in existing state laws, and how to establish new programs, policies, or projects to address the group's findings. The task force will also determine how any potential compensation should be calculated and who would be eligible, as well as additional forms of rehabilitation or restitution. The task force held its first substantive hearing on September 23rd and 24th, 2021, whereby we discussed the transatlantic slave trade, the institution of slavery, and the impetus and implications of the Great Migrations. Expert witnesses for the September hearing included Isabel Wilkerson, John A. Powell, and Douglas Blackman. Today uh, and yesterday, we are hosting our, our second substantive hearing on the contemporary harms against Black Americans particularly in housing and education segregation, environmental racism, and today in racism in banking, tax and labor, and the racial wealth gap. From a review of the agenda, you can see that it is a full agenda to ensure that we complete it during the time allocated. We will need to make sure that we follow the timeline established. So to help us keep us on time, I'm asking for all of us to be mindful and I'll remind us as well if we start to fall behind. Um, at, as of this time, I would like to say welcome again, and we will now move forward with agenda item number 12, which is public comment. Uh, we reserve public comment for 9.05 to 10.05. It is now 9.04, so I will turn it to Ms. Martin Walton, who will commence our public comment period. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moore. Good morning, task force members. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aisha Martin Walton. I am with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Enforcement Section, and we are now moving to public comment. Public comment will be for one hour. Each individual is limited to three minutes for public comment. At the three minute mark, your microphone will be turned off and you will not be able to turn yourself back on. However, there is a public comment period again at future meetings, and we welcome everyone in the community to make comments in the future. You may also submit written comments at any time via the email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. To participate in com public comment this morning, 
please use the raise hand function. You can find that button on the upper right hand side of the screen. On the right side, there's a shape of a hand. Once you click on that, it will prompt the raised hand feature. On our end, we will accept the raised hand. Then you will get a notification at the top center of your screen to continue. You will have to click the continue button and once you are accepted and brought into the meeting as a presenter, you will be automatically muted. Once it is your turn to comment, you will be unmuted and you will have three minutes to speak. At the end of your comment or at the three minute mark, you will be muted again and drop back down to attendee. We will accept the raise hand features as they come in. Once the person is in front of you is done speaking, we will say your name and prompt you and you may begin speaking. Please note that there's a 20 second delay between the attendee and presenter mode. So please keep that in mind as you begin being prompted to presenter mode to prevent your public comments. So with that, let's see who is here to provide public comments today. So Tunji, will you please provide and promote the first speaker? First, hello, Friday Jones. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. All right. Hi, I'm Friday Jones. My name is Kansa Jones Mohammed. I'm a city commissioner for the Mayor Garcetti's Los Angeles Reparations Task Force. I'm the co-chair of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants and the Los Angeles chapter. And our local chapter is a member of a coalition for a just and equitable California. Um, eligibility. As a commissioner for, the, for Los Angeles, a prevalent thought in my mind is time line and harm. Today I'm testifying from Scotland, North Carolina, outside of the only hotel in town are fields of cotton in full bloom. I am unapologetic in the recognition that three of my four grandparents are descended from enslaved ancestors who are chattel here in the United States. I'm mindful that my other grandparent whose father hailed from Barbados came to the United States in 1912, served in the United States Army at Camp Upton in New York, and whose mother was a full member of the Shinnecott Nation. Um, sorry, I got lost. The same nation that ultimately stripped her membership because she married outside of that nation. The same nation that would reclaim my grandmother and father, yet deny all of my father's <clears throat> children from membership in the Shinnecock Nation when their treaty with the United States was finalized. These nuances matter. These are the realities that you as commissioners will have to grapple with where slavery is concerned in the United States, my great-grandfather would not have a claim, nor would my great-grandmother born to the Shinnecock Nation. My great-grandfather entered the timeline of the United States in 1912. Did he live through Jim Crow and racist military service? Yes. It is um, your task to identify the nuance, not to create a one-size-fits-all tied to melanin or blackness. That's very European and very American. Lineage and harm matter. The United States Office of Budget Management, which sets the standards for the census, cannot in a modern era grasp the reality that Black Americans of the descendant community have both a racial and ethnic identity. Because as a nation, whiteness has been uh, the ultimate race barometer and Blackness has been reduced to a singular, which it is not. It is multi-ethnic with nuances. Uh, Amber Ruffin recently did a video commentary of a black town subject to racism and terrorism where white mobs uh, made lakes of the land. There was a list uh, that scrolled through the towns where those communities were terrorized and flooded with water. The towns in California were Kennett, Baird, Elmore, Morley. I ask that this commission use the subpoena power to look into those towns, cities, and document where that power laid, how the people were affected uh, by sheer racism. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Tunji, our next speaker. Hello, Serge. You have been unmuted and we now speak. You have three minutes. Hi, good morning. Thanks for um, allowing public comment and 
uh, the comments from myself, especially um, I'm a white conservative. <laughs> Stereotypically, I'm not supposed to um, be in support of any type of reparations um, program or government action. I wanted to um, share my comments because um, through, through Clubhouse, I've been exposed to um, a lot of people who identify with the ADOS movement and um, and and the like. I'm not sure how you know how everyone on this panel might feel about that movement per se or or lineage or whatever. But um, I just wanted to share that um, in being exposed to the movement, my political <laughs> Um, paradigm has totally been shifted and um, uh, I've been challenged in a number of ways for the good and uh, very much um, encouraged and challenged to to do a lot more more study on my own on a lot of the issues that are being discussed in this study or in this uh, action. Um, so to, to me, the question is not whether or not something like this should happen, but what, how recon, uh, reconciliation or recompense can occur. Um, so I just wanted to share that as a, as a white conservative, um, to me, this is of paramount importance for the for the state and the country to finally address. Um, that's all I really wanted to say. Um, I hope we can can you know address things that have happened in our past. Um, to to some degree and and really reconcile and and in good faith uh, you know come together as one and heal finally uh, and fully that's all thank you God bless thank you so much Serge for those comments Yunji do we have another speaker hello Mary you have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Hi, can everyone see me? No, we don't see you, but there you go. Now we can oh, see you see. and hear you. Okay, great. Yes. Hi, my name is Mary. Um, briefly, I'm on the other side of the country in Connecticut. Um, and according to the new London mayor here, Connecticut is the third most segregated state in the country. I'm currently living in public housing. And even as a biracial light skinned red bone, I've been discriminated against on this property. Um, I took legal action on my own without representation. It's currently still going on. Um, there has been two discrimination complaints submitted to the um, Human Rights Commission in this state. Both were ignored. Um, so racism is beyond someone within the community. It is on um, this state level. I've had many experiences in the state of Connecticut. It's, this, is, this is just the most recent. Um, I also like to say that um, my experience is unique being as though I come from both white and black heritage and I'm quite frequently put in the category of white passing White passing does not equal white passing treatment. When racist people look at me, they see black and they treat me accordingly. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just so upset. Okay. What I'm going through currently um, has been very traumatic in the state of Connecticut and I had to fight on my own with no help. And they have a history of discrimination on this property. Luckily, some changes did happen thanks to me. Um, I did contact the town select woman. Um, she didn't was not helpful at all, even though she had the power to appoint people on the commission, yet she doesn't have the authority to manage their behavior. So I, that's all I have to say since I have three minutes, even though it's a long story. It's all right, Mary. Thank you for, for 
coming on today. Thank you for calling. Thank you for supporting. And thank you so much for your comments. We really okay. appreciate it. The task force really appreciates it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tunji, our next speaker, please. Next, hello, Tony, Ray Harvey. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Okay, yes, this is uh, Antonio Ray Harvey, also known as Tony Harvey. Um, I am a staff writer with California Black Media, and um, I have been viewing all the uh, meetings up until now, uh, one through four. Well, uh, this part of the, this portion of it is, is getting started too, so I'll be on here for the next several hours as you are to uh, members of the uh, task force, and God bless you all. Uh, the reason why I was uh, uh, I wanted to uh, speak is I, I, I've been trying to reach you, uh, Dr. Reverend Amos Brown. We're doing a series of um, profiles on the task members, and we would like to start with you first. So I've been trying to contact you. I don't know if you have uh, received any of those messages, but I'm gonna keep doing that, and I do want to start with you, and then we're gonna move on to uh, Dr. Grills. And then uh, hopefully um, I can get to uh, Don, Attorney uh, Don Tamaki. Uh, Attorney Tamaki, I have been following Executive Order 9066. Um, I learned about it when I was a journalism student at Sacramento State University. So I'm very much involved in that, especially around here in the Sacramento community because there were a couple of uh, relocation camps, which I'm uh, very familiar and I visited uh, time to time. And I do go to some of the events that is put on by the uh, Japanese American uh, Citizen League. So just want to let you know that. And Dr. Grills, I know you um, are um, associated with some of those activities that has to do with the Japanese American community too. But also, um, before I move on, I just want to share this with you because I am a uh, descendant of the Great Migration, which was spoke heavenly in the last meeting. Uh, originally, I'm from uh, Illinois, but I've been living in Sacramento for the last 33 years. And what I learned from my uh, people, I think I'm like the second generation, but it's probably about five generations deep now in uh, Illinois. Uh, my people was from uh, Mississippi and Louisiana. And the illiterate ones, when they were making that migration uh, back in the 40s up north, they could not read. So some of the people, including my family, were told, look for the CH to get to Chicago. Well, some of them didn't make it to Chicago. They read the CH, they understood that, but they ended up in Champaign, which also started with CH. So they ended up in Champaign and not in Chicago. I thought that was very interesting. I just wanted to share that with you because um, there's many, many various great stories about the Great Migration, and I would have to say that my family is one of them. Um, of course, I think I was conceived in Mississippi, but I was born in Illinois, and I just want to share that with you. I think you, the task force is doing a great job. I'm, pretty uh, impressed with the structure of how these meetings are been taking place. So I know it's a lot of work behind the scenes. So uh, I will follow you for the next six, seven meetings that there is until you make that proposal in uh, January, 2023. I'm off the air, God bless you all. Thank you, Antonio. Thanks so much. Sunji, I think we're ready for our next speaker. Hello, Chris, you have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Thanks, Chris. Chris, Coalition for Justice and Equitable California. Big shout out to CJEC. Thank everybody for for joining today. And big shout out to Tony. I know Tony. Tony's here in Sacramento. Who, Tony, who, who was just talking. Uh, big shout out to California Black Media, Sacramento Observer, uh, Re Regina Wilson. I know we're going to talk a lot about black media as these reparations conversations go on. Very, very, very much needed. So uh, big shout out to, to, uh, to Tony. Also to the woman who called in, who, who, who was our first caller. Uh, thank you for calling in and really, you know, feel free to share your thoughts, you know, and your comments and your thoughts to the task force directly, you know, and be able to finish your, your story. Um, and if there's anyone in, in um, Connecticut who's watching right now, please find that woman and, and um, connect with her and let's get her some of the support that she needs, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing to say is a big shout out to e ETM Media and the live stream right now going on in our YouTube channel. So big shout out to e ETM Media. Also, I want to correct something that I said yesterday um, or add something that I said yesterday about 
uh, our community meeting coming up in Oakland, our second um, community meeting on no November 6th. Uh, I, I want to share that and thank Chair Moore for also joining our prior me our prior um, community meeting in September. I, I don't think I said her name yesterday. Um, and then also just to extend the invitation to uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, Mr. Tamaki, and I want to throw uh, Dr. Brown, uh, Mr. Mr. Brown, in there too. I know he's in the Bay Area, and again, I know there's a three two person rule. But Saturday, November sixth, if we can coordinate and get two of you there, uh, whoever two, which, whichever two, that would be helpful. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, do, I, I want to say a couple other things. One, uh, I was a part of the of the team that help write that special consideration language that's in AB 3121, myself and my good brother Marcus Champion, who may speak a little bit later today too. And uh, I can tell you 100% 100, 100 that the interpretation that uh, Assembly, Member, Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer gave yesterday is the exact interpretation of what that language is about. The, the, the specific community that's of interest here are those who descend from U.S. slavery, mm -hmm. um, and the interpretation is what Mr. Sawyer um, said, and I would urge us to stick to that. Last thing is um, I do want to just talk real, real quick about how we have this conversation um, around elig eligibility. Um, I think there's going to be um, some, some work that we have to do as a community as my last seconds run out here um, to actually have this conversation in a, a way that brings us together and doesn't rip us apart as a people. There are real enemies of reparations, um, but those enemies are not other black people and other black organizations who are also fighting for reparations. Um, when we get to the real enemies of reparations, we're gonna need to be as strong as possible and we're gonna need each other. And that's important right now. I'll stop there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comments today. Dunji, our next speaker, please. Hello, Tony. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tony. Um, good morning. I have been on the calls as most of the public speakers have been sharing, and I was one of the ones who did send an email to the DOJ, and I sent several emails to legislatures and other folks throughout DOJ regarding the treatment of this committee. However, you're a specific DOJ representative um, I sent my email to them directly and they did not respond, which was about three weeks ago. While I am very happy that you are on a good track now and that folks of this committee um, are now getting the perceived respect that they need and questions answered from the DOJ, I think that it's still to continue to push to make sure that the public is addressed directly by the emails that they do send. The other thing I want to let you all know is that this work is so important for folks on the ground who are black individuals. Um, continue to push so that those documents are people of descent are able to find their roots and trace their, th their lineage back. Um, as I've been watching this, I did that and discovered five generations, and I am one of those folks who can trace back to African, the person who came from the motherland to here and started the lineage here on both sides of my family. So it's so, and it changed my whole perspective about who I am, what I am, and my voice and calling into this work. As many of your public speakers know, I've been a part of this work as an ethnic studies major and have worked with um, Japanese Americans, um, Dr. Greg Mark, and many on that end. And um, it's just so important that you continue to do this because whether you come from, and I'm going to stop here, but whether you come from the continent in the 80s or whether you come as a descendant of a slave five generations down, this has affected us in ways that we have only begun to discuss. And as someone said, if somebody wants to arrest you because you're black, 
they're not going to stop and say, oh, what dialect do you speak? Or what are you mixed with? Or who are you married to? What color is the person that you're married to? They don't care. You're black first and everything else after that. So this work hopefully will help for our babies to not have to go through this again and again and again, that we are human beings, that we do have a standing, that we do possess a space in this country and have contributed in ways that people have just begun to understand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for your comments today. Tunji, our next speaker, please. Hello, Ade Jackson. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ade. Good morning, everybody. I was just calling into the commission to continue to encourage the work that you are doing. Um, I've often thought as a young person born and raised in Sacramento, California, why you know areas and neighborhoods that are known as you know South Sac or South Sac Iraq locally, like why they haven't changed in over 20 years and now almost going into my third decade, things are still very rough in that area. And it happens to be where a lot of the black community lives. Now seeing that this conversation is being had about reparations and redistributing resources, I kind of understand that there's now an opportunity to do some of that transformative work to improve the areas and communities in the places where we come from and the places where individuals like us and those that are not like us are located. And I think being a critical leader requires using the transformative tools that we have as well as thinking transformatively about the systems and institutions that we're a part of. That's why I encourage these efforts to develop resources and tools to really combat and challenge the status quo that often leaves black communities specifically behind, whether that's through systemic racism, you know, generational wealth or contemporary outgrowths from America's history of enslavement. And I, I see this commission's work as extremely vital. Uh, I'll continue to pay attention uh, and I'll just continue to encourage everybody to keep doing the work to make Black Lives Matter and continue to reimagine public safety as is involved in that process. So just wanted to encourage the work you all are doing I'll definitely stay in tune uh, with what's going on here. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the time that everybody has. And, you know, this is the work that it takes to make Black Lives Matter. So uh, I hope everybody has a good day and uh, I will continue to uh, stay in touch. And uh, yeah, I'm Ade Jackson. I'm an attorney out of L.A., also an organizer with Black Lives Matter in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, this is a great commission. Keep up the great work. Hopefully we can work together soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ade. Tunji, do we have another speaker? Next, we have Chad. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, Good morning members of the task force. Uh, thank you once again for giving your time to this historic effort and initiative. You are greatly appreciated by our community. I just quickly wanted to, and again, I'm a board member of Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, as well as a board member of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants in Los Angeles. I just wanted to echo the comments that you've heard from others that I work closely with, like Chris uh, Lodgson and Marcus Champion, uh, who did work directly on the development of that special consideration lang language that currently appears in AB 3121. Uh, they are speaking straight to the spirit that Secretary of State Dr. Shirley Weber intended in that language, as did Assemblymember Joan Sawyer. And I would encourage this panel to bring Secretary of State uh, Dr. Weber in to give her own personal uh, views and what she was believed, what she thought when she crafted that language. Because I do think that while we are, can interpret it, she can speak best to it. 
Um, and speaking just quickly on uh, lineage specificity, Chair, Chairwoman Moore spoke very eloquently yesterday about the differentials in wealth position uh, that were uh, that were viewed in the color of wealth report uh, that came out of the UCLA. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, William Darity worked on that. And as she said, there are wide gulfs in wealth position between Native Black Americans and you know Black immigrants uh, that recently came to this country. So there is a nuanced conversation to have here around eligibility, and I applaud how you have already undertaken this conversation and 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 just charged head on into it. I would encourage you to continue to do so. But on the note of disaggregation, I did want to bring something to your attention because previously when I called in, I talked about low hanging fruit. And on Friday, Governor Newsom vetoed how Assembly Bill 105, which CJEC worked hard to get disaggregate disaggregation language into that bill which would allow the state to improve their data collection practices to really give the true view of our condition here in California versus others within the larger black community. So I, I think that this panel has the opportunity to not only gather, collect information, but also take political and legislative action in the process, supporting bills like AB 105, which we will be reintroducing in the next legislative session. And thank you, Senator Bradford and Assembly Member Joan Sawyer for your support of that bill. We want to see better data. We have to be able to view our true condition in order to develop effective policy and legislative measures and measure the outcomes and impact of those initiatives. So please focus at, on eligibility, on specificity, but also on disaggregation and the data collection practices of this state that we need to implement and improve to make sure that what we are doing is targeting and reaching the correct communities. So thank you again. Have a great meeting today. Chad, thank you so much. The um, task force really appreciates your comments. All right. Tunji, do we have another speaker? Good morning, Angela Nirvana. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Yes, hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Education is great. We especially need to teach our history to our children. Since some in this country pretend we are the racists, we're wanting our kids to be taught true American history which includes our never ending Holocaust. But education doesn't guarantee employment, <laughs> given that our affirmative action benefits everyone but us, nor does it close the over $100 trillion egregious racial wealth gap. We've got 900,000 kids, 25 and under here in California, and of 215,000 teachers, roughly 12,000 or 5.5% are black. 22,000 of our kids are in foster care, our youth, make up 15% of youths nationwide, and yet 41% are detained. I'm asking yet again, even though we all suffer from racism, who's impacted by foster care and the preschool to prison pipeline? Nigerians with a $72,000 wealth position per the 2004 Color of Wealth LA report, some of whom descend from slave traders who chose to migrate here, or ADOC whose ancestors were sold into chattel slavery with a $3,500 wealth position or 4.5% of Nigerian wealth in the country our ancestors built with their lives. What you are contemplating with our reparations and sharing it with black immigrants is akin to another white wealth transfer, which clearly has already been done in education and the workforce, both in the public and private sectors per our affirmative action. Class-based policies don't fix race. When you elevate everyone, ADOX is still on the bottom. Furthermore, I don't recall any other group having to share their reparations with migrants. In closing, it is evident by the wealth position of immigrants, including the black ones and the wealth position of whites, that ADOX is clearly their reparations. It is time for ADOX to take care of ADOX. No other group is as oppressed and everyone eats from the wealth our ancestors generated with their lives but us their descendants. I thank you for your exemplary work on this task force and for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, Ms. Nirvana, for your comments today. Tunji, next speaker, please. 
Hello, Frank Elmore. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. I'm trying this again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Frank. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay. All right, yeah, I tried to get in yesterday and <clears throat> was very unsuccessful. But anyhow, it's going to be easier for me to just read my concerns here. Um, uh, one of my initiatives for uh, American Africans, not African Americans, who are Betos, that is Black Af American descendants of slaves, is that we receive necessary compensations from the United States to expense the invoice of providing funds to cover the cost of ancestry searches. The obvious purpose and goal is to support the search of Betos, which is Black American descendants of slaves, to determine our African roots. I wrote a, pres a letter to President Biden, and uh, very quickly, I think I can cover it in three minutes. Um, uh, dear President Biden, I pray this letter finds you well. The issue of reparations for the atrocities committed to and against enslaving Black Africans is an immediate and pervasive topic for many descendants of those enslaved Africans. I represent a category of descendants of those enslaved Africans, the American African ancestry, AAA. It is interesting that I claim to be of African ancestry, but I do not have a clue where my ancestral line originates. My ancestors were kidnapped, stolen, and sold into chattel slavery. Somewhere it all began with my African ancestors, but I do not know where. It is maddening for me to feel so lost and bereft of my true lineage and geographical origin. I present the foregoing as a premise for my writing you. Yes, I'm a reparationist, but reparations for Black American Africans is such a vague notion with few, if any, concrete and substantiated claims. My proposal focuses on a particular aspect of reparations. Reparations, in short, requires the actions of an offending party, the United States of America, to make overtures to repair and make whole the harms caused by the offender, USA, inflicted upon enslaved Africans, subsequently their descendants. The personal injuries are incalculable. Our first demand for reparations is simple. We posit that the United States of America owes all Black American Africans the order of providing all expenses related to our ancestral searches that will determine exactly where our ancestors were stolen, kidnapped, and otherwise unlawfully removed from. Moreover, that will result in our enhanced personal identities of where our origins and where we might return. We begin at the beginning, where in Africa we were stolen, kidnapped, and otherwise unlawfully removed from. This is our first demand for reparation, available for further discussion and concept development. Um, I uh, am now in in what's called Coachella Valley, a city in Coachella Valley, but Excuse I spent a me. lot of years in in Mr. Uh, Elmore. This is Aisha. I'm so sorry to have to it's cut okay. you off. It's okay. I'm done. Oh, that's okay, but appreciate, remember. Appreciate you guys. Keep on doing what you're doing. And feel free to come back for another public comment period at a future meeting. All right. Thank you. Benji, our next speaker. Next, we have Don Alston Page. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Hello, panel um, task force. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, I wanted to call back in. Um, yesterday I was speaking about uh, how universalism had been the uh, bane of our existence here in America as uh, descendants of chattel slavery. Um, I was a bit disturbed uh, by um, members Grills and Holder's confusion over who should be eligible for reparations. And um, I thought that that was very concerning. I think it's very clear that we are, um, this entire process was undertaken to address um, the uh, debt that is owed to Black American descendants of chattel slavery and that we are contemplating using our reparations claim as some sort of community development program or as some sort of way to fix the education system or some way to fix the police uh, 
that's that's not what the process is. That's not what we're here for. We're not here to fix uh, everyone else with the debt that's owed to us. I wanted to um, also point out the history that was dis uh, brought out right in this session about the uh, Department of Justice and their history of obstruction of justice. And I also want to point out that um, if we look at the profile of those who own slaves, we'll find that 40% of slaveholders were white women. And I just find it ironic that that is um, also the profile, you know, in terms of the demographic of who is teaching our children. But I just want to um, also point out that Kamala Harris and Obama both had parents who were here during the 60s, um, black immigrants who obviously were allowed to attend, attend colleges that we couldn't. So there is a difference, and I hope that we um, understand that and respect uh, what we're all doing here. And that's why I would urge the task force to uh, sooner rather than later determine the eligibility and to ensure that it is for Black American descendants of chattel slavery only and does not include any other groups such as immigrants. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thanks for your comments today. Junji, do we have another speaker? Hello, John Mudd. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to echo the sentiments of um, specificity in regards to who would be eligible for um, this uh, claim, um, and I just wanted to kind of be clear about what we're talking about here. We're talking about a claim that is in regards to slavery, exclusion from the Homestead Act, um, reneging on the obligation of 40 acres and a mule, black code laws, convict leasing, peniage, um, denial of new, do, new Deal benefits, racial covenants, segregation, redlining, and I could go on, but there's only one group who has been targeted by all of these things. And I think that people who are trying to um, bring all of these other groups into our reparation claim are doing something completely different than any other reparations claim that has been paid out by this country. Um, Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans face discrimination in this country, but it was the Japanese who received reparation for the internment camps. And then you have the Aleuts, um, who are the Alaska Natives who are also affected during World War II, who had a separate claim. Um, when we look at the reparations that Native Americans received, not all Native Americans received reparations, but many um, Native American tribes have received reparations, and each tribe had their own specific claim. So I think that if, if you wanna say that there are other groups who were harmed, um, they, they have to come up with their own claim um, in regards to reparations. But if we're going to speak specifically on the things that I listed out as the harms that were targeted towards my group of people, uh, the people who descend from American chattel slavery, um, then we have to be very specific about that group and only focus on that group. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Junji. Do we have another speaker? Next to speak, uh, we have Davenport Law Lobbying. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. To God be the glory for this opportunity. Please shake your hand and give me a hand raise if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so um, general public, great task force. I appreciate you all for just taking the time to deal with the public, right? Um, you can check me out, DavenportLawLobbying.com and get the resume. My sister's a lawyer. My mom's a lobbyist. We're God-fearing people who do good work, right? We don't go in the barbershop and talk about things that should be done politically and then come to people's task force during public comments and confuse people, right? 
So I understand there's a federal claim that's going on in reference to slavery, but everyone on this task force understands what the law is in California, right? And moving forward, henceforth, I'm gonna use the term human trafficking because that's what it really is. So California failed to protect human trafficking victims that came in the country, and that was wrong. That's the claim, okay? But more specifically, we also gotta make sure we don't focus only on the past and we focus on the present. We already got the calculations, the assessments, right? I honestly feel like it's a waste of time how this task force is um, leading things. But then I have to remind myself, you know, you can't, you can't cut anybody out, Mr. Davenport. Other people are on the third grade level in this reparation struggle. So this is my point. D-A-T-A-A-G-R-A has the expertise in handling all these things that I'm just going to blow your mind with. Freeman, ADOS, B-A-A-D-O-S. Did you even know that existed? How about this? S-C-A-A-D-O-S. All this stuff. Your people at the bunch organization is good, but I've reviewed the website. They're not prepared. 800, whatever the amount of money is, less than a million is crazy. 765 is less than two cents a person. Let's get those numbers up. Let's get the money to the people who skill, and we're going to get this done the right way. I love y'all. God bless you. God bless America. Yeah, make sure y'all keep having fun. Peace. Thank you so much for your comments today. All right. Kunji, do we have uh, other speakers? Junji, do we have anyone else um, who would like to speak today? Yes, we have Sharice Sear. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Good morning. My name is Sharice Cryer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sharice. Great. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Sharice Cryer. I am a, a SoCal resident, SoCal native, and also descendant of American slavery on both side, both maternal and paternal sides of my family. I just wanted to congratulate the task force on the awesome job that you are doing. Um, watching these um, public hearings and public comment the last few weeks has uh, really been great and eye-opening to see um, the development of um, this process. So I wanted to um, ask a question, um, what is the task force and the DOJ taking into consideration from public comments? The same people are calling over and over again, the same passionate people are not asking the same things. I've sent several emails to the DOJ um, task force email address and it seems like some of the concerns or questions are not necessarily being addressed. I know um, one of the uh, task force members mentioned um, something that someone spoke about yesterday from the public comments, but it would really be, um, uh, it would be helpful to see what the DOJ and task force have taken into consideration from the pu public. Um, the next thing is you cannot uh, speak on eligibility for reparations until you define what re reparations is. And I'm going to um, uh, point out Evanston, Illinois, they decided that reparations was going to be real estate payment. And so while we're talking about who is eligible for reparations in the state of California, you really need to define what reparations is before or during the time that you're um, trying to determine eligibility. Finally, I'm going to um, call out Dr. Kramer because I feel I've sat on uh, two panels with him and I, he's very nice, super intelligent, and I feel comfortable calling him out. Um, but I'm going to ask the task force to please ask Dr. Kramer today when he speaks, what is reparations and um, ask who is eligible for reparations, and I would ask the task force to continue to ask expert witnesses so that you can actually get a better idea of what reparations should be and who's eligible. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ms. Cryer. Junji, we have time for more speakers. Good morning, Antonio Thomas. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Hello, everybody. My name is Antonio Thomas, and I am 
um, uh, De Descendants of American Slavery, Slavery, ADOS, and I'm also <laughs> Freeman. It was established in 1865, which is Frederick Douglass, Chris Rivers, Hiram Revels, and Harriet Tubman also was Freeman due to the act that the 13th, 14th Amendment has the blueprint for uh, Freeman to be a federally protected class that is under special field order number 15, series 1865, where the military order was given in the Civil War, which Adolf slash Freeman were the people who fought for their own independence, and, and each bill was set by Congress. And I would like the task force to look into all those bills and laws is already set on uh, civil rights in 1865, which was redone in 1965. That gave women and other groups the same um, the same level of abbreviate that we tried that we were supposed to get, and to look into those civil rights acts and be very specific when you come to de aggregating our numbers. Uh, verifying our deline delineation and using us as a protected class. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thomas, for your comments today. Junji, is there anyone else waiting? <clears throat> Hello, Robert Kalen Reed. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Hello, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Robert. All right, I'm with my grandmother and she's sleeping, so I'm gonna try to make this quick. Um, first of all, I would again like to ask the um, commission to uh, try and get Antonio Moore, attorney Antonio Moore on as a expert witness. I think he, uh, he does a very good job at laying out the narrative of why um, reparations is such an important issue of the time. And I think based on the work he's done, based on the numbers and the data that he's compiled, he tell, he paints a pretty compelling picture. And so I would really like to see him on as a witness. Um, I also understand that the commission is going to vote on the chat. I really urge a yes vote for the chat function to be restored. Um, there were a lot of answers to some of the discussion that was had yesterday evening that people wanted to answer in real time, uh, answers about the subpoena powers and where we would like to see subpoena power uh, uh, legislated or given so that we can receive data, whether we're talking about discrimination against black farmers, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about housing, um, credit and loans, and things like the banking institutions in real time. I don't know if there's a miscommunication between the DOJ and the commission, and I understand that they came to clear up some of that yesterday, but if anything else, if you guys can see the chat in real time, then you know, you know where some of the audience and community members are going. And so you would have uh, some kind of um, just something to go off of. And so I really urge a yes vote for the chat to be restored. And uh, that's about all I, um, I have to say on that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kalen Reed, for your comments this morning. Junji, is there anyone else? Hello, Amaru Young. You have been uh, muted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Good morning. Honorable Reparation Task Force of California. My name is Amaru, as was stated. I'm a board member of the NCEEJ.org based in California. I say honorable because the job that you're tasked with is the most honorable one in the United States of America, history outside of the Civil War. I want to co-sign Angela Nirvana's statements because although there are other groups within America, America that have suffered from racism in this country, no other group has suffered and continue to suffer as much as the American descendants of slaves. Again, I plead with the board not to delay in identifying this group that is in question. I also plead with the board to not allow justice claim due to the American descendants of slavery be all lives matter uh, when ensuring that true justice is done. The American descendants of slavery can no longer be the mule for all groups of oppressed people uh, in this country, meanwhile being left in the bottom of a real life caste system. 
Also, when it comes to understanding the debt that is owed to the American descendants of slaves, it will not be satisfied through education nor the uplifting of marginalized community, especially when those communities are now being gentrified. When the gentleman was speaking about integration communities, he failed to bring home the message of the lack of resources that was given to said black communities. If those resources were allocated to our black communities, we will continue to have the black Wall Street that was destroyed through uh, white supremacy and terrorism. The level of reparations owed to Adolf should exceed the $6.3 billion that was just recently given to the Afghans for their participation in serving the United States interests in Afghanistan, especially since our efforts were was for the salvation of the United States itself. I would like to bring this message home even further. We are not people of color. We are, bi we are not BIPOC. We are the American descendants of slaves who built this country, who fought in every war since this country existence. And we ask that this board take that into consideration uh, when determined who should receive the reparation. And we also ask this board to get a true or better understanding of reparation that's owed to us. It's not something that's going to uh, take care of all of this, you know, all of this country ills, but it is something that is due and owed to the Americans and as a slave. And I ask that this board take that into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, it is 9.57 and we have time for a few more speakers. Tenji, do we have anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, our next speaker, uh, Kash Gaines, you have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Uh, um, again, uh, hugs to everyone um, on the um, task force and to Mr. Tamaki Adip Bao. Uh, I want to say that first, again, as everyone has reiterated, y'all are so, so important to us in modern day, um, especially with the specificity, um, because semantics has been played on us over and over again and to our detriment. Um, and when it comes time for uh, 250 years, Black Americans prevented from being able to read and write, uh, um, I thought affirmative action was meant to fix us specifically. But reading it now, I understand, and also having realized that the biggest receivers of affirmative yeah. action, as I've mentioned before, are white women and white men who identify as homosexual. The truth is that affirmative action has not helped the Black American community. We were trying to reach out and be on some All Lives Matter, as was said earlier, intersectionality. Um, with racism, it's the same thing. We should be specific to those who've been harmed and not try to help everyone, as those are separate issues. Uh, um, th what we're talking about is not discrimination, but surviving economic attacks. Maybe that's another way to look at it. Um, I just want to say maybe facetiously as a black American, it, it makes me feel a type of way when people uh, try to chalk up the black ex experience to white folks see us all as criminals. I want to make it very clear that when uh, um, people uh, immigrate to America who look black, they are criminalized as uh, um, the 13th Amendment allows criminals to be uh, 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 slaves. But I, I hope people can say in the same breath that looking black also uh, makes you look cool and also makes you a part of the buy black movement since people are disproportionately supporting those businesses. I'm tired of us trying to fix everyone else with the debt that's owed to us specifically. It's been to our detriment over and over again. Um, by 2023, you guys are gonna be able to actually help with domestic tranquility in America. So again, I uplift you uh, with special consideration being mentioned uh, in this bill from the origin. In my mind, from the beginning, that was the inheritance owed to the slave descendants, the cash payments of direct cash payments, as well as the land. And lastly, I want to say that we don't want no surveys. We don't want no either or. It needs to be yes and. Please be yes and. And it needs to be 800 credit score resets, direct cash payments with lump sum options, uh, and perpetual dividends from the green rush. Uh, uh, and I want my 40 acres and a Tesla. And thank you guys again. Uh, much love. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Um, it looks like we have uh, about six minutes, so that would be two people. Tunji, can you share with the task force how many people are waiting in the queue? We currently have two people in the queue. Okay. All right. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Nzinga Griffin. You have been uh, muted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you, Nsinga. Yes, go ahead, please. 
Okay, um, I'm Nazinga Griffin. I'm a third generation ADOS California resident. And, um, you know, we, we do know that the harms that were done as far as slavery have been done only to American descendants of chattel slavery. And it's ridiculous that someone else would be. It looks um, like we should have about 14 uh, people. Uh -oh. Hello? All right. Let's, let's try that again. Dunji, can you bring Nzinga forward? We lost her. I believe she was disconnected. Oh, okay. All right. We can go through for our next speaker. Yes, please. Next, uh, hello, Ernest. You have been uh, unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Good morning, task force members. My name is Ernest Russell, and I am a descendant of American chattel slavery and U.S. freedmen. I'm calling today to advocate for reparations and ask the task force to support reparations that is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely, basically a smart goal. Um, I advocate for a yes vote on enabling the chat just for reasons of supporting free speech and allowing others to, you know, weigh in on the uh, the process in case they aren't able to. I did want to leave the task force with some words from Dr. King um, from a speech that he wrote as it relates to reparations. Some of our friends recoil in horror. The Negro should be granted equality, they, equality, they agree, but he should ask for nothing more. On the surface, this appears reasonable, but it is not realistic, for it is obvious that if a man is entered at the starting line in a race 300 years after another man, the first would have to perform some impossible feat in order to catch up with his fellow runner. In 2016, California Governor Jerry Brown signed AB 1726, which was a bill to, that would require the Department of Public Health to break down demographic data it collects by ethnicity or ancestry for Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander groups. This is the perfect example of why delineation and disaggregation matters. According to activists who supported the bill, better data on the different needs of our community translates to more effective public policies that save lives. AB 1726 allowed a clearer pathway to formulate policies focused on positive outcomes for specific communities. Not only do I support the legislation, I believe more legislation likes it, like it needs to follow for Black Americans, specifically those who can trace their ancestry to those who were enslaved in this country. It is important that we recognize all communities are unique and have specific needs that are aligned with the history that they have in this country. When it comes to reparations, it is important that we recognize that those who suffered the harms of the claim discussed in these sessions are those who deserve the sole focus of compensation and repair. If a broad, if a broad approach is taken, we run the risk of trying to heal rotten gunshot wounds with a Band-Aid, which is what America and the California government has attempted to do since freeing the formerly enslaved citizens. The Black American community with its ancestry ties to American chattel slavery and Jim Crow are old reparations. It is the only remedy that can heal the systemic ills, be they de jure or de facto, against Black Americans. Due to 446 years, I mean, due to 246 years of brutal enslavement, the rape of black women for the pleasure of white men, and to produce more enslaved workers, the selling off of black children, indentured servitude, lynching, mob violence, sharecropping, Jim Crow laws, mandatory segregation, black codes, bans on black jury service, bans on voting, imprisoning people unpaid, medical sterilization, and experimentation. Excuse me, Mr. Russell, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your sentence and your, yep. your, your thoughts. I'll, 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 I'll end by saying this. You can't heal our community without being specific. And again, you're trying to put a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound, and it's not going to work. So I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you so much. Thanks for your comments. Chair Moore, apparently we have a couple more people in the queue, but we have time in terms of our one hour limit for one more person. Junji, how many people do we have actually? Aisha, we currently have four in the queue. That would put us over about 12 minutes or so. I mean, it would be 12 minutes for all four folks. Or we can invite folks back um, at the next meeting, December 7th and 8th. 
Well, let's just take the rest of the comments because I'll make the announcement um, at our first panel of the day, but um, there's one panelist that won't be able to join us. Okay. Um, and so, so there's some time. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, next speaker, Tenji. Next, we have Danielle Eves. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Thank you very much for uh, the time this morning. Task Force, I thank everyone for uh, dedicating your time to uh, make sure that the proper repairs and justices are done um, for the American descendants of slaves. Um, I want to take the time to appreciate uh, the task force and such a thorough and wonderful job. Um, I'm just going to restate and reiterate a couple of things already said and just kind of put some um, things up. I have sent a um, formal written um, you know, uh, request for delineation to the task force specifically. Um, and I just want to give a brief description of what that is. Um, me being a study in gene genealogist, not quite certified, but working on it. Um, I learned a lot of things about the American descendants of slaves that um, are not properly being told in our history. Part of the great injustice of what has been done to us is actually the denial, erasure, and eradication of our history and true lineage throughout America. What I would request of the task force is to consider who should be repaired. The specific and sole repairs should consider the time of 1789 from when our Constitution was ratified through 1865 when those harms were ended in the form of slavery. Um, in that you have various different avenues of how you become an Amer American slave. Um, those black, mulatto, even people of color, but they were all slaves. The harms that continue to proceed unto today through Jim Crow, Reconstruction, redlining, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, Iran-Contra, et cetera, were specific and direct to a specific set of people formerly known as slaves. Those things were done to people who are now being reclassified as African-American and or Black. With the erasure of our history through the hands of President Barack Hussein Obama, by strengthening the word Negro, it has ultimately placed us in a position to have to self-identify. That self-identification we'd like to use is American descendants of slavery, Adels. It is the only thing that would encompass all that we are. It speaks to people who can find themselves between 1850 and 1880 U.S. Census as black, Negro, mulatto, or people of color. And these people also still identify as African-American and or black today even ADOS on U.S. Census as of the last 10 to 15 years. I submit this evidence as a study in genealogist and ask that the task force receive it in good faith. I thank you for all your work and I've landed. Have a great day. Thank you, Ms. Eves. We appreciate your comments. All right, I think we're going to accept three more speakers. Tunji, who is next? Next we have back Zingan Griffin, you have been uh, muted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Okay, can you can you hear me? Because I don't know the. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Nzinga. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So this is Nzinga Griffin. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you, Task Force, for all that you're doing um, in this work. Um, I'm third generation Adels, California resident. And as I was saying before, um, the harms from the slavery in the United States were done uh, towards American descendants of slavery. Obviously, um, those are the only victims of slavery here, and we should not be having to um, share reparations um, with other groups for slavery. Um, they should be um, setting up claims to get slavery um, reparations from those that enslaved them, like the CARICOM efforts. Um, I don't think those are being shared with members of ADOS. Um, it's only for those that were enslaved, um, you know, in those areas there, and it's not being shared with other ones, and we shouldn't be required to do that either. Some of the people that would be um, getting reparations as well um, are even descendants of slaveholders, um, and that wouldn't be right either. Um, another comment I have is please turn the chat back on, vote for it to be turned on. Um, it's very useful during these meetings. As you can see, there's only 100 people here. There might be about 50 listening 
in other avenues. It's not enough people. The public should be engaged. There should also be an afternoon comment section so that you guys can keep up with the community, knowing what the community is uh, is is uh, feeling and wanting um, in regards to this um, effort that you guys are doing. Um, yesterday, I heard um, some people come on mentioning Habitat for Humanity, Cal, um, HFA, um, Section 8, and other pop other pipeline um, systems for things like housing. Um, and you guys have talked about um, things like education, but what, what are the stats for Habitat for Humanity? How many um, ADOS families have they helped? What about Cal HFA? How many mortgages have they given out to um, ADOS families? Maybe we can have those stats before we uh, willy-nilly go about giving out um, contracts and agreements to people to um, service these um, things that you guys are looking for to be um, remedied. Um, we need to make sure that we have grassroots organizations involved in anchoring these efforts. Um, one group that I um, do recommend um, as a member of the ADOS lineage community, um, I trust CAAAGRA to, to coordinate all paid labor for the community engagement job plans. I have met with one of the board members and he knows our issues. He wants to hire ADOS to do this work. That will ensure the wealth gap is not widened as we work for our justice claim. This is an immediate way to get us help by your all endorsing the CAAAGRA to lead the paid in community engagement work. I think if this is our ADOS justice claim, we should lead the paid work. We should be the leaders, the ones getting this information out to the communities. Um, even as an anchor organization. So I do support Mr. John Burgess in the California um, AAGRA. He promised us he would lead, and um, this is exciting um, that he feels that ADOS should lead the way. So please make Thank this a Miss Griffin, um, I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you in the middle of your, your sentence and thought. Um, thank you so much for your comments this morning. And our, we will take our last two speakers. Junji? Who is next? Next, we have Brandon. You have been unmuted and may now speak. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, this is not about people who chose to immigrate to this country under the guise of American dream. And when they got here, they still have suffered and had to deal with things. This is about the people who were stolen and sold and robbed of their land. Their culture was beaten out of them. And then they've had to endure everything ever since. It's a culmination of things. This is about a certain lineage who did not choose to immigrate to this country for a better life, but one was robbed of their life. So we, we have to really look at this holistically. And I want everyone to understand this country won't made whole until these people are addressed. And California, is on the block so everyone is um, gonna base their things off of what happens here it's very important to get it right I'll end there thank you thank you thank you so much Brendan all right we're we will hear now from our very last speaker hello Hello, how are you? Hello, this is Mintz. Is it okay for me to? Yes, you, you have been promoted to presenter. Thank you. Okay, so when uh, reparations is mentioned in regard to freedmen and, and or ADOS counterparts, education is typically mentioned as a form of repair. Despite the fact most education learned about reparations and justices and true history, are acquired outside of the existing institutions and research conducted externally from colleges and universities, we must take a look at the data and current circumstances to address the problems. As we know, their root cause, which obviously was mentioned um, in, 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 in the previous responses. We clearly understand the root cause. And as it stands today, even with more education and access to educational resources, our experiences remain the same. Financial literacy, education and community developmental incentives will not solve nor repair the freeman community. What needs to be addressed is the experience lost and currently not granted due to 
sabotage plans, false promises throughout history and practices allowed and never addressed. This effort must be reparative and experience driven as others who were not victims did not receive their liberties limited and guided. We were restricted in every sector of society, learning and education, communities and media, art and culture, economics and business, peace building and relations, justice and governance, health and wellness, food, water and environment, as Flint is a perfect example. We must be granted fair access and equal opportunity and neither can be provided without reparations being free and not guided and limited. And it has to be repetitive. It has to be repetitive. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mins, so much for your comments. Thank you all. Um, thank you for your comments to the task force today. We have reached the allotted time for public comments. If you were not able to provide a comment, we invite you to attend future public meetings. The next meeting will be December 7th and 8th. And please, at any time, feel free to submit written comments or testimony via email at reparationstaskforce at dlj.ca.gov. And with that, I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Ms. Martin Walton, uh, for facilitating uh, public comment today. Really appreciate you. So moving forward to agenda item number 13, witness panel three, where we will be discussing racism in banking, tax, and labor. And this panel will run to 12.05, and then we will have lunch from 12.05 to 1 p.m. So at this time, I would like to remind each witness panel that their testimony is recorded, live streamed, and will be available to the public. I'd also like to make an announcement that David Smith, who was scheduled to uh, give personal testimony, he is a retired airline pilot who has served in the United States Air Force and the Texas National Guard. He served on the Sacramento County Grand Jury in 2008, and he is an area director for the NAACP. And um, he had family members, particularly his father, who was a Tuskegee Airman. Um, he had a family emergency, so he will no longer be able to speak today. Uh, but hopefully, you know, um, if able, we can bring him back for a future hearing. Now, I will I will introduce um, our panelists who are here and ready to provide expert and personal testimony. The first expert witness that we will hear from today is Dr. William Spriggs. Dr. William Spriggs is a professor in the Department of Economics at Howard University and was formerly the chair of the Department of Economics. He currently serves as chief economist to the AFL-CIO. Previously, he served as the assistant secretary for the Office of Policy at the United States Department of Labor under President Barack Obama's administration. The next person we will hear in terms of expert testimony is Dr. Jacqueline Jones. Dr. Jacqueline Jones is a professor of history at the University of Texas, Austin. She is the author of several books, including Labor of Love, Labor of Sorrow, Black Women, Work, and the Family, From Slavery to the Present which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and won the Bancroft Prize. Our last speaker will be Lawrence Lucas. Lawrence Lucas is the President Emeritus for the United States Department of Agriculture Coalition of Minority Employees, which represents thousands of employees within the USDA and also advocates on behalf of farmers uh, unfairly impacted by the department's practices. Mr. Lucas has testified before houses of Congress about discrimination faced by USDA employees and the farmers they serve. And between 1135 and 1205, we will hear from uh, Marissa Baradaran. Marissa Baradaran is a professor of banking law, financial inclusion, inequality, and the racial wealth gap at the University of California, Irvine Law School. Her book, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, was awarded the best book of the year by the Urban Affairs Association. After we hear from um, Mayor Sabaradaran, we will turn to the task force for comments and questions. Without further, further ado, um, I would like to turn the mic over to Dr. William Spriggs, who will have 20 minutes to provide expert testimony. 
Dr. Spriggs, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Moore, and thank you, uh, Vice Chair Brown and members of the uh, committee. I appreciate your time. I apologize to you that I didn't get this to you in advance, um, but I do want to do this with a PowerPoint. I think pictures will be very helpful in explaining um, uh, what I want to try and, and convey. So, um, my task was to share with you a view of why labor matters in this equation. So I'm going to go through some of the institutional forces that have shaped black earnings before 1940, and I'm going to explain that in a moment. Could you please confirm that you're seeing the screen because of the way this works? I, I can't see, or do you see it? Confirmed. Okay, thank you. So this is the path of, of wage gaps uh, since 1980. You can see the dark blue line at the top. This is the wage gap of black men compared to white men. This gap has increased. This is the average hourly wage gap. It's gone from a little over 22% to well over 30% in that time period. If you adjust for education, occupation, um, education, region of residence, whether they're metro or not, and only look at full-time workers, you see that the gap is 22%. That's the light blue line. For black women, this is full-time, part-time, everybody. The raw gap has climbed to 19% higher. And then this is the gap for, uh, that's against white women. And then the blue line at the bottom is black women compared to white women adjusting for education, occupation, et cetera. It's important to take note of the light blue line and the red line, uh, sort of the lighter red line, because these control for education. This is the difference in the returns to skill acquisition. So when people think that if we only look at education, if we compensate for educational differences, we will have solved the problem. As you can see, you clearly would not solve the problem. When you look at the wealth gap, what you are looking at is a cumulative function made up of initial wealth holding going back to 1865. The returns to those wealth holdings plus the returns to the savings from income and from income generated from wealth, savings from the income generated from wealth. So if there's a wage gap, there will be a savings gap. Blacks and whites have virtually the same savings rates. So if you make less money, your aggregate savings will be less because you have less to save from. That gets compounded. So this 31%, or if you prefer to look at it from the viewpoint of a black man with the same education, living in the same area with the same background, every hour they are 22% behind. Their savings get compounded year after year after year, and that explodes into the wealth gap. So that's why it's important to understand the wage gap. I'm going to show you this slide because I want to take you back a little bit further because you saw that there was already a gap at the beginning in 1980. If we go back to 1940, you see there is still a gap. The line at the top are white men at the top of the white income distribution. These are those, and these are annual salaries, those who are at the top 10%, the 90th quantile. If you look just below that, these are the top earners for black men. And you can see the gap. In 1940, at the top, white men made almost twice as much as the highest earning black men, 40000 compared to $20,000. For those at the median, these are the blue dashed line, 
The blue dashed lines with the triangles are white men at the median. So it's more or less the typical person, right half below, half below, above. And then the blue dashed lines with the black dots, these are black men at the median. And you see repeated again this gap. White men at the median were making close to 20,000, black men at the median close to 10,000, roughly twice the amount. You see these lines move pretty much in parallel. There's some gains made for black men at the very high end, but these gaps are moving kind of in parallel. That's because there are structures already built in. And these structures are what you have to interrupt. But these structures and these pay gaps are brought forward because again, the savings from that time period get compounded into the wealth of today. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples um, and I'm going to start with the concentration of an example dealing with actions of the state to create these wage structures. I'm going to give you a concrete example of actions of workers against other workers and then an example of companies working against workers. Uh, I was asked to try and make this a little personal, so I'm going to start with that. Um, this is a picture of my great, great grandfather. That's the gentleman there at the bottom. Uh, this picture was taken in Beggs, Oklahoma. It was at the funeral of my great, great grandmother. The woman on the far right is my great grandmother, Matilda Spriggs. The gentleman to her immediate right, you know, the picture going left of her, uh, is going to be important for this story because uh, that's Isaac James, who was a locomotive fireman at the time of this picture. And the gentlewoman who is in front of my great grandmother on the on the right. Uh, the shorter woman is Emma James Wade. She's going to be important for this uh, story at the moment that I'm going to talk about. She was a school teacher in Alabama, a certified school teacher uh, in 1899 in Alabama. Uh, when we look at the 1940s, this was the occupation teaching of blacks who had college degrees for the most part, well over half of blacks were teachers if they had a college degree. 76% um, of Blacks uh, with a bachelor's degree were teachers if they lived in the South. 28% uh, of all Blacks with a bachelor's degree were teachers in the South. This is key because it gets to state action. This is discrimination that limited the mobility of educated Blacks, the most educated, those with a college degree, before 1940. If we look at what that pay looked like, this is 1940 pay of college graduates. These are sort of major occupations that college graduates had at the time. You will see the red line indicates the pay for teachers. And if you look in the South, you see that white teachers with college degrees were paid about $1,200 a year in 1940 compared to Blacks who are paid somewhere close to $760 a year. Outside the South, you see that Blacks did better, but that's a clear, clear indication of what's going on here. If Blacks could move to the outside of the South as teachers, they gain, gain quite a bit in pay. In fact, they would be paid much more than white college educated teachers in the South. Why didn't they just move? And this gets to the act of discrimination in hiring black teachers. The primary role of black teachers was to teach black school children in the South. And so they were constrained, they were prevented from taking their skills and their talent across state lines and enjoying their skills. Oddly, the most skilled workers in this scenario, didn't migrate. Now, this shows you the distribution of uh, teachers. This is with some college, because in the 1940s, there were still people who had teacher certificates, 
they didn't require a full bachelor's degree. The black lines represent the black teachers, the red lines represent white teachers. The axis on the top is telling you how many teachers there are uh, for blacks and the bottom for white teachers. And you can see that blacks are heavily concentrated in the South. This isn't simply because the black population is concentrated in the South, it's because black teachers teach black kids. They are concentrated in the South. You will notice that in the 1940s, one percent census, there are no black teachers who appear in the Pacific. This means California, Oregon, and Washington. They are constrained, they are constricted to living and working in the South for the most part. Some advance when you look at the East, North, Central, which is the Great Lakes, meaning Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, areas that blacks have begun to, to migrate to. The Middle Atlantic is where we would find New York and areas in New Jersey and Philadelphia. 1950, it starts to spread out a little bit more. We get to see more black teachers spreading out a little bit, um, but they are still, even by 1950, still highly concentrated. This concentration is the clue to you that blacks are being confined. This is what teacher pay looked like by race and region and by educational attainment. If you look in the South here, we can see it more graphically. You see that whites, this with the blue line is some college, the red line is a bachelor's or more, that whites with some college are approximating the pay that blacks had, even if they had a bachelor's degree when they were teaching. And you see that the pay in the South is much lower than in other regions. Again, another indication that this high concentration of blacks in the South, if they could have moved, if they could have gotten a job outside the South, they would have greatly benefited. They weren't able to. And you see overall, that's on the far right. This is what you know blacks as teachers were paid overall. You see how much heavily influenced it is by the South, nowhere near what the average is for, you know, uh, blacks outside of the South, because the, again, the bulk of them are living in the South. So you see this gap, blacks overrepresented, highly segregated into teaching, paid much less than whites. This is state action. They are being paid by the state less than their counterparts. Now, black people did not sit by. I'm gonna include in this presentation, lots of issues of black agency. Black people didn't sit by, they figured out how to get education they figured out how to fight against this. The first case, and this again to make it kind of personal, Aileen Black, who taught at Booker T. Washington High School in Norfolk, Virginia, was my mother's science teacher. Uh, Aileen Black volunteered to be the first test case brought by Thurgood Marshall and the team of lawyers from the NAACP. Most of these are Howard University Law School faculty members to fight for her equal pay. The response of the school board was, you, equal, you entered into this uh, agreement voluntarily. Uh, you knew you were gonna get paid less. If you don't want the contract, fine, don't take it, they fired her. Uh, subsequent to Aileen being fired, uh, then another teacher at Booker T. Washington High School stepped up, um, Melvin Austin, and was the successful case uh, that Thurgood Marshall brought to bring about equal pay for black teachers in the South. And so when we skip to 1950, we see that the pay has become much more equal in the South as a result of litigation that started in the 1930s, hadn't taken full force in the 1940s, but by the 1950s, you see that blacks with a bachelor's degree are paid much more than whites who only had teacher certificates, paid close to what whites were being paid and that the overall pay for black teachers, that's the yellow line there in the South, is clo much closer for blacks and whites. Outside the South, you see great success for blacks. They are now outpaid compared to whites who are in teaching. And overall, you see much more equality between blacks and whites in terms of what are teachers being paid. That's because of black agency and fighting against that discrimination, it does not erase the 50 years of history up to that point where there was unequal pay compounded into the savings that generated a wealth gap. And before we get too happy with the idea 
that, oh, wow, you know, we got equal pay for the teachers, uh, so blacks with college degrees were doing okay compared to whites. Um, you can see from this uh, graph, the blue shades are uh, the pay for whites, uh, the orange shades are the pay for blacks. You see, teaching is not the high paid occupation for people with college degrees. It's being managers. Whites who are managers are paid the most among the people with college degrees and professionals. These are occupations in which blacks are underrepresented. Again, this sense of being denied access despite educational attainment. So that's important to keep in mind. This is an example of state action, confining blacks to the South, relegating them only to teaching in segregated settings, and even within that setting, having discriminated against them. Blacks fight against that, fight for equal pay. Get it, but this does not equalize the playing field. It only removes one element of that barrier. State enforced is important because that's a contribution of the state to this action. Think about why there weren't black teachers in California in meaningful numbers before 1950. And before you say, well, they weren't there, I'll just remind you, one of the reasons I showed you the picture of my family, well, Emma migrated to California in the 1930s. Her brother, who was on the far left, um, came to California in the 1930s a little later. Uh, black people from Oklahoma, in particular, after the Tulsa riots, were quick to move to California. Remember that Los Angeles was basically an oil town at the beginning of the 20th century. These were people from oil territory in Oklahoma. And before we get too happy and celebrating about all this equal pay stuff, again, personal, the arrow there is pointing to Lacey Spriggs. That's my uncle. He was the first black principal in the Des Moines school system. Uh, this is 1966. And you will see, even though he is, uh, he, at this point, he, he had a master's degree and was principal of a junior high school there in Des Moines, he's the lowest paid, the lowest paid secondary principal in the city, despite his master's degree. And if you look below there, you will see um, elementary school principals who are paid more than he's being paid as a junior high principal. Um, about 15 years later, the city um, standardized the pay for uh, junior and senior high school principals and this pay disparity disappeared. But it's important to note that even in 1966, this kind of disparity persisted even outside the South in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm gonna talk now about uh, the significance of Isaac James, um, distant great, great uncle of mine. Uh, in that picture, I told you that he was a fireman. This is the educational attainment of all railroad workers in 1940. You can see it's a job that is readily accessible even for men at that time because the bulk of the workers had an eighth grade education or less. This is a middle class job which is benefiting from the technological progress of the era. The change from uh, water power to electricity meant that factories didn't have to be located next to water. Railroads become vitally important. The industrialization means that we need to move lots of goods very quickly. Um, some not located near water, the railroads become vital. Um, so this is a job which sort of men with typical educational attainment could uh, make a good living. They were early on in the ability to unionize. You see the difference between blacks and whites in terms of educational attainment isn't really that great. Um, the majority of blacks had eighth grade or less. You see that there are some blacks with college or more. There's a little red line, the college or more is on the far right. And you can see that there are blacks in the railroad industry with some college. I'm gonna concentrate on these locomotive firemen because it's an occupation that black men were easy to, 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 to get into because it, when they were steam engines, this was a dirty job. This was a filthy job. You're shoveling the coal that keeps the fire going. Uh, the steam engines of that era were crude. They could explode. If you didn't have the skill to maintain the steam pressure properly, this was very dangerous work. Plus, it was dirty and grimy. No one wanted it. 
that's how black men were able to have access to it. You can see that for black men, the pay, the $1,250 a year was much higher than what black men were getting in other occupations in the railroad industry. For whites, it was about the same, not that much different than what whites outside of the locomotive firemen were getting. And that's again, because whites could be engineers, blacks could not. And whites who were in some of the other occupations were still paid more than blacks. You see the average pay for blacks compared to whites. Whites in this industry paid almost twice as much, even though most of these workers have little more than an eighth grade education. In terms of the importance of the industry, you see the big growth in firemen that's taking place. It peaks near 1920 because in the early part of the 20th century, that is when the diesel engine gets introduced. And by the 1920s, the railroad industry is quickly transforming from steam powered to diesel powered engines and the job of firemen totally switches. It goes from a job that nobody wants to a job that everybody wants because they don't actually need somebody to stoke the fire. This is now a clean job. Fireman really means that you're an apprentice to become an engineer totally different job. And you see black men receding in numbers, almost disappearing from this occupation after 1920. There's a tick up in the 1940s because the war effort, we had to use every engine we possibly could. And they didn't want all the oil going to engines. They used some of the coal for trains. And so there's a tick up in firemen that takes place during World War II. So that's the spike you see from 1940 to 1950. The black share of railroad firemen, just like with the teachers, highly concentrated in the South. By the peak of the demand for this job in the 1920s, blacks are over 25% of the firemen in the South. But you see they quickly decline because as the new technology comes in, as the transformation of this job from firemen to apprentice to being an engineer takes place, black men are being chased out. They're able to hold on during the war effort, and that's why you see the slight rise outside the South for Blacks um, taking place in the 1940s. This was the help of the war effort. Now, here's the key. Um, in 1940, you notice there are no Black men who are firemen under the age of 33. This is the this is the locking black men out of this occupation. The only people under 33 are white because they are apprentices to become engineers. The black men who are left are left because you can't get rid of all the steam engines. You, you still have some left, but these black men oddly within their labor contracts now have super seniority. And so the result is that within their union contracts, they should be the most favored as firemen. Now, again, this is the educational attainment of people who are firemen. Again, heavily less than eighth grade um, is the dominant uh, educational attainment. None of the black men here have much more than an eighth grade education. Um, you don't see black men with more than eighth grade education in this occupation. In if we do the typical thing that economists do, you know, let's look at, um, are these black men being paid fairly controlling for education and age, uh, age being the experience? You see there's a positive return to age, which is experience. You're getting paid more for your experience. You actually don't get paid more for education. You get paid a lot less for being black. This 32% gap is the similar gap that we're talking about today for black workers. That gap is the same as then in 1940 for this vital occupation. Black men did not take this sitting down. Remember, they have an advantage because they have seniority in those positions as firemen, and they're supposed to get the most desired runs and get paid the most money. They did sit down. You see this suit brought by Charles Hamilton Houston, who was famous for getting the Howard Law School into being the fighter for civil rights bringing this lawsuit on behalf of the black firemen suing their union for this discrimination and winning. 
winning an award against the Brotherhood for damages sustained by the plaintiff for not being given his full bargaining position. Agency, agency, agency. We have to remember that it isn't that Black people accepted where they were. They fought constantly. And it's important to note that when you think about what is it that was done wrong. It's not that Black people didn't understand it, that they didn't try to find avenues around it. They fought back. Now, remember I said there were Blacks with college degrees. Where were they? Here they are. This is the education and race of railroad porters, the Pullman porters, the union represented by A. Philip Randolph. And as you can see, Black men with college degrees wanted that job because that was the job that was accessible to them. So it's important to note how the acts of discrimination created these hierarchies that created the gaps that we see in 1940 that then takes off and gets compounded because that structure compounds and compounds each year with that wage gap. What you're looking at right now is a film taken during World War I of the 325th Field Signal Battalion. This was close to 400 Black men who, as you see in this film here, were trained to repair telegraph lines, telephone lines, and something no one in the United States knew how to do, radio. At the dawn of World War I, the United States Army only owned two radios both of them had been made in Germany. No one in the United States knew how to fix or repair radios. These men were a rare group of men with special skills. They were organized and trained just like their white counterparts, exact same training, exact same equipment, exact same skill. They go over to World War I to fight as you just saw. They early on encounter combat. On September 27th, when they get there, Lieutenant Herbert, a black man who was one of the battalion's lead black officers, is out on reconnaissance. He gets ahead of his line. The group turns and walks straight into a German machine gun nest. They take out those two machine guns. Unfortunately, they lose. Uh, Corporal Charles Boykin um, and later Sergeant Henry Moody, the first two casualties for the 325th. William G. Herbert from New York enlisted voluntarily in Washington, D.C. Why? Because he was a student at Howard University, where these men were trained in radio technology to prepare them for World War I with a skill that no one else had. You see him here after the war with his war record um, and his enlistment, and he's still active uh, in New York with the state military. Um, and then he continues with the reserve, the 369th Infantry. Um, notice here, though, his degree says he has a doctor of dentistry from Howard University. He became a dentist. This is important to note. This man who has this rare skill in radio, rare skill in a technology no one else in the United States had, he becomes a dentist. Uh, but you will notice in his obituary that he's at the same time a personnel service supervisor at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Why? Because he wanted to continue to use his skills in electricity. Um, even though he was being denied the full ability to do that. Another incident takes place with the same troops. Uh, Rufus Atwood of the 1st Platoon is in the cellar of a switchboard. Private Edgar White was operating the switchboard. Uh, Private Clark, the buzzer phone. Uh, several of the men are standing in the dugout cellar and suddenly German shells hit their position and the ceiling and the wall explode. Havoc occurs in the cellar where the switchboard is located. Lieutenant Walker, who is the black officer there, um, arrives in time, gets everybody under control, 
Sergeant Atwood then, with the aid of two of the privates who are there, um, reconnect this switchboard vital to communications while they're being attacked. They reconnect the switchboard while they are under attack with bombs falling around them so deadly that it hits an ammunition dump and that starts to explode. In the midst of all of this, these men are skilled enough to put their position back together and keep communications going. A little bit about Lieutenant Richard Walker. You see when he enlisted, he was a student at Fisk University. Uh, his father was a railroad postal clerk, high paying job, $1,400 a year for a black man in 1901. It's a lot of money. Um, his grandfather, Nelson Walker, well, he went to Fisk University because his grandfather, Nelson Walker, helped to found Fisk University. His father-in-law was the U.S. ambassador to Liberia. This is no average person. He goes on after the war, please note here, he works for the employment service and he helps to place uh, workers out of the state of um, Massachusetts uh, during World War II. He's enlisted to help recruit skilled black workers. This is Sergeant Rufus Ballard I spoke of. He won the Bronze Star for the incident I just described. He becomes Kentucky State University's sixth president, the longest serving president in Kentucky State history. But please note what he did. The skilled man in a technology no one knew. What happens to Adolphus Burrell? Well, he ends up being a tailor, a presser for a tailor. This man who knew how to do telephone. Edgar White ends up being a chauffeur in Chicago. He leaves his home state of Kentucky for the opportunity to be a chauffeur, even though he has this rare skill. Briggs. Back to 1940. Um, I'm going to wrap up here. 1940. You. 1940, you see what, what, what is going on in the telephone industry? No black person is hired who has high school, some college, college or more. None of those 400 men gets hired by the telephone company. None of those 400 men end up in radio. None of them. The industry ends up being segregated. This is what industry could do. So these barriers are barriers of state effort, barriers of collusion among workers with employers, and the outright exclusion by employers. That's what generates this gap. That's what generates the savings gap that then compounds to the current wealth gap. It's important to keep that in mind. Thank you, Dr. Spriggs, for that informative expert testimony. Um, and we're looking forward to asking you questions. Um, the next panelist that we have to speak is Dr. Jacqueline Jones. Dr. Jacqueline Jones, you may begin your expert testimony. Is Dr. D Jacqueline Jones here at this moment? If not, we can move on. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good morning. We can hear you anyway. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before the task force today. My emphasis today is on the harmful discriminatory effects of government policies at all levels, local, state, and federal, combined with private employer strategies related to profit making and workplace configurations. I'll be following on uh, Dr. Spriggs' analysis. Governmental entities played a significant part in promoting and sustaining racist practices, especially before 1964. As a result, those entities bear a direct responsibility for persistent patterns of poverty and low levels of asset accumulation among black families in California and throughout the nation. Even after the passage of major civil rights legislation in the mid-1960s, Private companies such as banks and corporations have engaged in lending and hiring practices that help to solidify patterns of racial inequality. Residential segregation and the harmful effects of U.S. tax policies continue to have adverse effects on black families. 
The history of black women represents a key element in this larger story of public-private complicity in limiting the economic opportunities for all black people. Many black Californians today trace their lineage back to the US South where their forebears were enslaved. The institution of slavery was a massive government sustained program of wage theft, affecting millions of people of African and indigenous descent. Enslaved women worked in the fields and in the kitchens and parlors of their white masters and mistresses, performing what was traditionally considered men's work, growing crops, as well as women's work. They labored under the constant threat of sexual assault from overseers and plantation owners. The rape of women was an instrument of terrorism, but it was also a means of growing the enslaved workforce, thereby enriching the owner. Between 1619 and 1808, approximately 10 million women and men, women, and children were forcibly re removed from Africa to the Americas. The vast majority went to the Caribbean and South America. Indeed, only about four to 6% of the total were transported to what would become the United States. Yet by 1865, the nation's black population amounted to over 4.4 million people, revealing a dramatic pattern of natural growth over the generations. That number suggests the arts, labors of skilled hands, domestic servants, and bearers of children. Marked by shocking levels of sadism and sexual license, the system of slavery amounted to a form of state-sponsored domestic terrorism. Yet this system found favor with white Northerners, many of whom after 1790 or so benefited directly from the cotton economy as sea captains, merchants, textile machine operatives, and consumers of cloth. The United States Constitution does not mention the word slavery, but the 1787 document did protect private property, which included enslaved workers. In 1790, Congress stipulated that only free white men should be allowed to immigrate to the United States and eventually apply for citizenship. At the local level, towns and counties sponsored slave patrols who were groups of white men charged with recovering fugitives and maintaining a racialized order on the countryside. In 1850, a robust Fugitive Slave Act passed by Congress served the explicit interests of Southern slaveholders. During the Civil War, many enslaved people liberated themselves by seeking refuge behind Union lines. Black women labored in refugee camps as servants for Union officers and as laundresses for Union troops. In many cases, neither they nor their menfolk hired as fatigue workers received the financial compensation they had been promised. About 180,000 black men from both the North and the South served in the Union military, though until the last year of the war, Black soldiers were paid less than their white counterparts. This discriminatory pay scale had profound effects on the well-being of wives, children, and other dependents. For Southern Black soldiers serving in the Union Army put their loved ones at home at risk for their lives. In the wake of the abolition of slavery, the U.S. government made no concerted effort to compensate the millions of freed people who had literally slaved their whole lives to enrich their owners and the country generally. Most black men and women emerged from bondage with only the clothes on their backs. They had no cash, land, or credit, prerequisites for self-sufficiency in the rural South. Throughout the rest of the 19th century and well into the 20th, the vast majority of Southern black families remained landless, confined to the exploitative sharecropping system and living as peons, forced to remain on a plantation until they could discharge their debt as reckoned by the white landowner employer. As late as the 1930s and 40s, many Southern black families were tilling the soil much as their enslaved forebears had generations before. Beginning in 1890, all of the former Confederate states passed laws or amended their constitutions to deprive black men of the right to vote. Some states entered into contracts with private employers to supply black convicts men and women who had been arrested on flimsy pre pretexts and sentenced to labor on a chain gang or in a mine or a rice field. At this point, it's helpful to step back and consider larger national trends in the gender division of labor. The Civil War opened up new employment for women in the fields of school teaching, as Dr. Spriggs has discussed, and nursing. 
Black women who followed these professions were confined to work in under-resourced segregated schools and hospitals. In the late 19th century, the clerical retail and manufacturing se sectors offered employment opportunities for white women. They were hired as receptionists, department store clerks, and telephone operators, as well as machine operatives. Throughout the country, a higher percentage of black married women worked than their white counterparts, and black women stayed in the paid labor force longer than whites, indicators of the need among these women to be joint or sole breadwinners in families that could not subsist on the meager pay of black